then people will stop doing this. I say no. I can even see one from the Central University of Tamil Nadu. No, no, no. No, 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 no. Central University of Tamil Nadu thing is in my study room. This is a mezzanine floor. Oh my! I say you have a mezzanine floor. My God! Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, yeah, yeah. people get here. Yeah. I know, yeah. I mean, actually, work, Anupurni work. is having a meeting, so she has occupied the study room. I said, work. I said, Anupurni is also having a meeting. Right? Yeah, yeah, work yeah. From home, everyone yeah. is working from home. Huh? Yes. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> so good. So fair warning, all of you are on uh, live on YouTube also. So careful with your condition. Oh, sure. Oh, okay. So we should keep putting a disclaimer. No, um, this yeah. is not my view. This is view which I'm just just oh, taking yeah. TV. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, is it uh, University of Hyderabad, Vaidishwaran? Hi. Please <laughs> let it go. Where is Vaidhi? Yeah, I've unmuted him for a second. Hello, Madhuri Ma. Hello. Hi, uh, this is Kalavati and Shridhar, and uh, thanks for the organizing this. My pleasure entirely. Hmm? Hello. Hi, I said my pleasure entirely. Oh, fine. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, good, good, good. <laughs> yeah, I am going to listen to Ram after uh, nearly twenty years or twenty-five years. Good Lord. <laughs> I, I hope I say something different. <laughs> yeah. Now we unmute. Another uh, three minutes. Okay, Madhu. Huh? I'm planning to start in two minutes. Yes, I'm just uh, ensuring that the VT is ready. Are you okay with that? Yeah, sure.
So in about two minutes, we'll start this off. Not see anybody? Ah, yes, sir. Yeah. Good morning, sir. Hello. Oh, hi, Professor Das. Ah, namaskar, namaskar. Good namaskar. morning. How namaskar. are you? I'm fine, sir. Fine, sir. With your blessings. Good. It's so nice to see you. <laughs> so nice to see you, sir, again after a long time. Very long time. <laughs> we have been yeah. trying to get you here. I, I remember. Know. I remember you. You introduced me to Tarangwari. Right, I, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. May I request Madhurima to kindly introduce? Uh, yes, sir. I mean, uh, uh, good morning, everybody, and this is really a pleasure for me to be uh, organizing this decennial commemorative talk, which is finally started off. And you know, I know how happy I am about that. Having struggled to get this going. Um, today's speaker uh, is somebody that does not need an introduction to most people, but then as a formality, I am going to introduce. Uh, Professor Ram Ramswamy did his BSc in chemistry from Lyla College, Chennai, uh, MSc in chemistry from IIT Kanpur, PhD from Princeton University under the supervision of Herschel Rabbids. And between uh, 1978 and 80, he worked uh, at California Institute of Technology with the Nobel laureate Rudolf Marquardt. He returned to India in 1980 and joined uh, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. In uh, 1986, he moved to Jawaharlal Nehru University as one of the first members of the School of Physical Sciences. And in addition to that, uh, he has been a uh, faculty at the Center of uh, Computational Biology and Bioinformatics in School of Computation and Integrative Sciences at JNU. He is one person who has gone from being a chemist to a physicist to a system biologist to back to being a chemist. Um, as on date, he has supervised about 25 PhD students. And in 2011, he was appointed uh, the Vice Chancellor of University of Hyderabad. After his retirement from JNU in 2018, uh, he has been with IIT Delhi as a visiting professor in the Department of Chemistry. He has served as the president of Indian Academy of Sciences, Bangalore, uh, between 2016 and 2018. Um, what is nice about having him as our uh, speaker and chief guest is that the UDN has always had a large percentage of women students, and slowly the number of women academics is also increasing. Professor Ramswamy has been a very vocal supporter of women in science and has edited biographies of contemporary uh, women scientists. Not just women, as an academic administrator, he's known for bringing in inclusivity. He has been formally associated with CUTN as a member of its executive council. But uh, in a, as an academic, he has uh, been instrumental in drafting what was the uh, hydrodynamics workbench with uh, Kapil Krishna way back in 2010. So I was sitting at his office in JNU and you know, we mentioning about starting the physics department in CUTN. He said, I have already done it. Here are the list of experiments, a set of seven very elegant experiments, uh, which taught everything from uh, uh, acceleration due to gravity to onset of uh, uh, chaos. So I really can't think of a better person to be uh, chief guest for this application. He's a very kind and patient mentor. 
but a perfectionist and a taskmaster when it comes to being a team leader. Uh, this is the speaker for today and the occasion being uh, the decennial of the UTN. I request our Vice Chancellor, Professor A.P. Das, to say a few words about the UTN itself. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madhurivan. Sir, I, on behalf of the university, I welcome you to give your uh, very valuable talk here. We have been trying to get you here so that our faculty and the students and staff members would have been en enlightened with okay. your talk. I remember when I joined this university, you are uh, one among the prominent executive council members, and you are one who contributed remarkably to this university by your support, moral support, and all such, all type of support and everything is here. We are really unfortunate because of COVID-19, we could not get you here. And uh, you could have seen the university also, how it has progressed during the last 10 years. But let me tell you, sir, since you are the executive council member when I came, the what the university, what you have seen now, where it is now, today you are having 28 departments. Mm -hmm. And we are having uh, 165 faculty members, regular faculty members. We could have completed the faculty interview and uh, almost 90% uh, faculty would have been recruited because of the COVID-19. We could not do that. We have to suspend all the interviews after February 2020. This COVID-19, as you know, is a very unfortunate affair. Mm. And we do not know how we are handling in India about COVID-19 because I have different types of uh, uh, impressions about that. I know well, when I was in WHO, I was in charge of handling swine flu at that time in 2009. Mm -hmm. And we know how we handle it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, this is, a, this is a crisis we have to face. And uh, the university is also facing problem because of COVID-19. We have asked all the students to vacate the hostels and go on March 20th. Mm -hmm. And uh, some of the faculty who are here, uh, they are working and all others are working from home. And the MOOCs were very much activated with mm -hmm. Dr. Madhurima and others and uh, through MOOCs and uh, through uh, the online teaching continued and all the courses are over and completed. And in the meantime, we had some flagship publications, sir. You'll be happy to know mm -hmm. that uh, the our H index has gone up to 32, though it's a new university. 32 is not a big number, I know. But if you see the number of citation per paper mm -hmm. among the new central universities, Elsevier made an analysis in 2019 that the citations per paper of CUTN is 9.8, is the highest among all new central universities started after 2009. We have some flagship publications. As you know, in 2015, you have one paper in Nature. In 2016, we have an indigenous paper from here in Lancet Infectious Diseases. And after that, we have seven papers in Lancet and other eminent, prominent journals in chemistry, material science, physics, and many other subjects. So publication-wise, you have gone well. Teaching, we have completed all the lessons. And only one thing that we are going to have the, we have taken a decision for the final year teaching, final, sorry, final year examination. And, uh, but we received a, a circular yesterday from the ministry that we have to do the online or offline examination for final year students by September uh, uh, this year. Yes. So this is now we are going to meet today to decide what is to be done about this. Because we had already taken a decision accordingly, a very smooth, clear decision accepted by all faculty members, accepted by all students. So now we are going to think in that line. Our student strength has gone across 2000 now. Mm -hmm. So we are progressing, sir. I, and I sincerely hope and request you to continue your blessings to this newly and newly instituted in university. And I am here for a few weeks only. August 5th, I'm handing over charge to someone and I'll be leaving. So uh -huh. thank you so much. But you will be in charge in at personal level. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Please. Mudurima, hand it over to Mudurima. Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Sir, the floor is yours. Okay, one second. Can I, is my screen now shared? Yes, it has been, yeah. Yeah? Yes. Okay. Except for the color palette which is still seen. Except for what? There's a color palette with all the pencils. Yeah. Oh. That is still seen, yeah. 
one second. Um, all right. And that's the one. Is it is the palette still there? Uh, I I think it stopped sharing your screen. Okay, yeah, one second, one second. All right. I should be now now I'm sharing, right? Right, this is good. Okay, okay. Uh, good morning, Professor Das. Thank you very much uh, for this, you know, rare privilege of being able to uh, speak at the University uh, of CUTN. Um, first of all, let me start by congratulating all of you. Ten years is a short time in anybody's lifetime, but uh, for a university, especially uh, coming up in this time. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, it's a good landmark. It's something that needs to be celebrated and uh, see, and uh, the Central University of Tamil Nadu has done, uh, done everybody very proud. I'm both happy and proud to have been associated as a member of your executive council. And uh, let me just say that your, what you mentioned right now is so impressive to have crossed 2000 students in this short time is exceptionally good. Um, and if it's good for anybody, and I let's just hope that we come out of this crisis uh, a little stronger and with new directions. Uh, this is a talk that I was to have given at the university. It would have been my first visit to the campus because all our executive council meetings were held in uh, Delhi, in Chennai, and uh, so on. But um, it seems that the universe had other plans uh, for, for me. Uh, the title of the talk today, which I had given you know, long ago, uh, somehow captures the difficulty of this uh, situation that we are in. Um, you know, and what I, what I want to do today is to discuss what is chance and uh, what does chaos have to do with it? Now, uh, this is in part a technical talk, but uh, I also realize that the uh, audience is mixed. So there will be uh, stuff which is not just physics or mathematics, but also uh, implications for other parts of the natural sciences. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm also aware that, uh, you know, we have uh, distinguished epidemiologists, people who have worked with, uh, you know, other, other areas and other tools. So uh, I'll try to make this somewhat general. Now, the word chance is used uh, in language all the time, you know, and it, it sort of chance ki baat is a fairly common phrase that we use in everyday language. Uh, so let me talk about, uh, you know, the, uh, let me sort of introduce what is it that I want to talk about. We are used to the fact that uh, certain events are contingent, uh, future events, which are or circ or circumstances, which are possible, but cannot be predicted with certainty. These are events that are termed contingent events. Now, uh, there are a lot of contingent events. A pandemic, for example, is a contingent event. Um, everyone could tell you that every year you predict that there will be one or the other or the other event, but you can't predict it with certainty. These are all things that are possible. In its basic form, chance is the absence of necessity. When something happens without the fact that it has to happen, then we use the term chance. Uh, if, I, if I have this bottle of water over here, if I let go, it will definitely fall down. There is no, you know, gravity makes it impossible for this bottle to do anything but fall down. Now, so that, you know, that is the, you know, that is necessity. It has to fall down. Chance, on the other hand, is when something happens without 
this particular kind of necessity and we are surrounded by uh, many phenomena that uh, oops, uh, th that uh, that are dominated by chance all over nature uh, you know in, in both biological and non-biological form uh, aspects uh, chance plays a role there's a very famous uh, book by the Nobel laureate Jacques Monod, which is called Chance and Destiny, uh, Chance and Necessity, sorry. Uh, and there he says, nature relies on chance and not on destiny. Uh, and, you know, as we are seeing this entire thing of the virus playing out, we can see that one small chance event um, and the consequences of it have been so huge, we do realize that there's a lot of truth to what Jacques Monod says. Closer home, the great statistician C.R. Rao, who happens to be 100 years old this year, as it happens, um, he says that, you know, he's a statistician, so he says the chance may be the antithesis of all law. Uh, if an event is dominated by chance, maybe it doesn't follow a law. But then he says the way out is to discover the laws of chance. And what I want to do in today's talk is to try to understand, at least in a few situations, how does chance come about? Now, what is chance? A chance event that we use all the time is the tossing of a coin. We use it to start cricket matches, football matches. We toss it to take important decisions. Um, we use it in, in mathematics. We use it in uh, computer simulations. We use it all the time, tossing coins. It may be more sophisticated uh, tosses of coins. But a chance event may be due to incomplete or imprecise knowledge that is, you know, there's just so many variables, there's so many things that are happening and we just don't know uh, what is, uh, you know, what is sure to happen. Therefore, it, you know, the prediction is a chance event. Or as we realize increasingly, there can be intrinsic fluctuations in systems and those can give rise to effectively what is chance. Now, when you take an event like uh, the tossing of a coin, from a purely physical or a mathematical point of view, it's difficult to imagine that there is incomplete or imprecise knowledge uh, because, I mean, how complicated can it be? There's a disk, it's a coin, it's a disk, it has a certain mass, it has a certain size, and uh, you're tossing it. And the question of intrinsic fluctuations in the system also doesn't arise. So in 1986, uh, the mathematician Keller uh, wrote a very nice and simple paper. It's called the probability of heads. So he says, what is the, why is the outcome of a coin toss considered to be random, even though it is uniquely determined by the laws of physics and the initial conditions? If it is random, why is there a definite probability associated with each of the outcomes, regardless of how the coin is tossed? And finally, if there's a definite, definite probability for each outcome, how can it be calculated? All right? So basically, he says that, look, why are you calling this uh, you know, a random event? Because everything is known about it. Um, so what he does, and I'm just, I, I, can, all, I can share these slides so you all can please, you know, those who are interested can follow through with the uh, uh, mathematics and so on. So he takes a coin which has got a radius A, and he says it's, uh, it's being tossed up with a velocity U, right? Uh, and uh, the, the initial velocity is U, the acceleration to gravity, uh, due to gravity is G. Uh, and its initial position above, above the ground is just taken to be A for just convenience. And he does show that you, you can solve these equations uh, and you find that when the, uh, oops, all right, the, when the coin will hit the ground, uh, you can see 
you know, if you call that time t0, when the coin hits the ground, the angle at which it hits the ground is between these two bounds. And these two bounds depend on the initial velocity and the angular uh, and the angular velocity that is the spin with which you have uh, tossed the coin. Now, uh, with a little analysis, you can fi figure out that these have a certain relationship. And if you assume that once the coin hits the ground, whatever face is showing up is, is going to stay forever, then you can, you can see, uh, unfortunately, I don't seem to have a pointer with, uh, you know, with, with this, uh, all right, maybe I do. Uh, let me, let, I'm sorry, let me just see if I can get a mouse. All right, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the, um, I, I don't have a pointer to, uh, you know, to point out um, on this particular uh, screen, but you can, uh, all right, now, all the white regions in, you know, so here is a little diagram of how does the probability of heads depend on uh, the initial velocity u and the initial spin or the initial uh, angular velocity omega, right? So all the black regions are those regions that correspond to the coin showing you heads. And you can see that, uh, you know, if you have very low angular velocity, that is omega close to zero, and you throw it up with a very low velocity, if you throw it up with heads, you're going to get a heads, right? And, but this, this is what the screen looks like. You know, if you, if you uh, change the initial velocity and the initial, uh, um, uh, the initial spin, uh, then what you get is just that the initial space is banded up like this zebra, right? Uh, now, you can actually do some rather nice mathematics and uh, you can figure out that if the initial conditions are done randomly, then the outcome will be random. And you can, uh, you know, the random, the randomness over here is in the probability of initial velocity u and omega. Now, if you take pH, this is the probability of h, this can either be, it can be any number between zero and one. And what Keller shows in his paper is that regardless of what number you want, supposing you want the probability of heads to be a half, there is a way of choosing all your initial conditions so that you will get a half. And if you choose the initial velocity to be high and your initial angular velocity to be high, then and only then, for all conditions, you get that the probability of heads is a half, all right? Now, this is a, a sort of, it's a counterintuitive and a, a not a very, uh, you know, I mean, it's not a result that, uh, that sort of is, is widely appreciated, that given a true coin and, a, uh, and, and sort of a, a random, enough sufficient randomness in choosing it, you can still get any probability, you know, heads with any probability because of this, uh, because of this fact, one second, uh, all right, that the region of, of the uh, initial condition space, that is the region of velocity and uh, angular momentum is just broken up into these uh, striped zebra type of patterns, all right? And it's only when you go to very high velocities and very high angular momentum that you find these regions which are uh, where you will get probability one half. Okay, uh, now this problem has been revisited uh, much more recently by Mahadevan and Yon. Uh, and in a very nice paper in physics today, they discuss what happens when you when you start when you take a coin but you don't just keep it like what keller did which was uh, to keep it as infinitesimally thin 
But so what Mahadevan and Yong did was to uh, take this, uh, this particular coin and give it a certain width. So now in addition to falling heads or tails, it will also fall on its side, if you like, all right? And Keller's result is shown here on the left. On the left here, you see that uh, uh, the, the Keller result in, instead of black and white, it is now blue and red. So the blue, re blue regions all correspond to heads and the red regions all correspond to tails. And as you go, in, as you take initial conditions, which are both high velocity and high, uh, uh, high angular velocity, you see that you have this little disk of initial conditions where the amount of black, uh, the amount of blue and red is almost equal, all right? And Keller's result is that as you go further and further up, you will get exactly um, the, 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 the probability will be the same, uh, will be equal for heads and tails. Now, if you have a coin with some thickness, what happens is that the picture just gets blurred a little, all right? In addition to it falling heads or tails, it could also fall on its side, but the probability of heads or the probability of tails is equal. Now, this is to try to, you know, to discuss that, look, this is not a problem where randomness is going to be coming out of thin air. This is a very straight, straightforward problem. And there is a very nice way of analyzing it. And even better, uh, you can do an experiment. So here is a coin tossing experiment uh, that these gentlemen did, Diaconis, Holmes, and Montgomery. And uh, so you've got your, you know, instead of a thumb and instead of, you know, now you can control the whole experiment. You put it on a spring. The spring is released by a ratchet. And uh, Madhurima, you can make this experiment at CUTN if you like, because it's a very simple, simple thing. No, no fancy uh, mechanics over here. Now, the result, is the 2007 paper says, with careful adjustment, if a coin is started heads, always lands up heads 100% of the time. And they can change all the conditions, you know, the number of flips, the number of turns, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but always they will get heads. Namely, if, if you, uh, you know, look at the, uh, sorry, if you go, uh, if you go back over here, uh, they are now, adjusting everything so that they are always in the blue region, uh, sorry, in, yeah, in the blue region over here. And uh, they conclude that the coin toss is physics. It's not just some random uh, event. All right. Now, we've been used to, uh, you know, using this kind of randomness uh, in, in real life. Uh, and uh, in sort of in, seven, in 1700 and something, the French, uh, uh, well, uh, he was a gentleman of leisure and uh, an with an interest in science. He said, what is the probability that if I throw a needle uh, on the floor, it will fall between two dice, uh, two, uh, two strips. Now if you think of a floor which has got strips of wood and you throw a needle or a, you know, a stick, uh, what is the probability that this will fall, fall exactly on the, uh, uh, one second, I'm just shifting my screen a little. Okay, what is the probability that this will fall on a boundary? Now, this is a very simple problem in geometric probability. If you assume that your needle has got length L and uh, the distance between the, uh, the slats or the, the, the two you know, uh, strips on the floor is T, then it will cross the, uh, the boundary only if the center of the needle falls in a certain region and it falls with a certain angle. Now, if you assume that it falls at a, re at a random location and it falls with all possible angles, then it's very easy to see that the probability of a needle hitting the boundary, all right, is just given by this number over here, 2L divided by T times pi, okay? Uh, 
Okay, and the reason pi comes into this is that you have to do an integral, and uh, this integral uh, to to get the probability, and this integral uh, depends on some uh, you know some geometric fact, trigonometric factors over here, and you find that uh, the probability is just given by this quantity, which depends on pi. Okay, so here's a needle, here are strips on the floor and suddenly pi comes out of it. So what Mr. Buffon did was to actually calculate pi by taking a needle and dropping it n times. I did it just before this talk uh, and you can do it online at a particular website. Uh, you can take a needle of any particular length that you like. You can draw your, your, your stripes on the floor with any width that you like. And if you throw a thousand needles, uh, I got pi, and the value of pi that I got was 3.144, which is not too bad. So we use randomness in uh, practical terms, all right? Now, I would like you all to just keep this in mind because on the one hand, I've told you that tossing a coin, which we use all the time is not random, whereas, throwing a needle on the floor that it falls anywhere with any orientation that is in fact random. Now, chance, as we know, plays a very major role in biology. The origin of life was a one-off event. It happened once in, in the entire history that we know of, of this, uh, at least of this planet, uh, if not of the uh, solar system or beyond. Now, in the process of natural selection, again, chance is known to play a very major role. Uh, things happen because they do, and we are seeing how this virus is evolving as it is moving around, and this is uh, what is helping it to succeed. Uh, more, you know, technically, there is the prokaryote to eukaryote transition, which is, again, a chance event. And even our being a over here, uh, you know, the fact that humans are around, uh, you know, the, and the dinosaurs were uh, driven to extinction, that is, again, chance. It was a random phenomenon. One meteorite came and hit the Earth uh, some 65 million years ago, and all the dinosaurs uh, went extinct. So chance does play a major role. But this is in contrast with how we describe the physical world. Our physical world, uh, you know, especially physics, starting with things like Kepler's laws, Newton and Leibniz's uh, calculus and mechanics and so on, we've always looked for deep principles, symmetries, conservation laws, which have been determined by beauty and elegance. And more importantly, if you want uh, something to be called a law, we should be able to compute with it, we should be able to calculate it. Namely, we should know everything about it, determinism. Determinism is like the antithesis of chance because uh, if something is determined, then that's how it has to be. All right. So uh, when we look around, we want the most appropriate mathematical framework to describe nature. And this has been uh, a very important thing in the landscape of physical sciences, uh, because many of the descriptions that we have of nature are only approximate. Now, Einstein was sensitive to that, that the descriptions of nature are approximate because he was a great believer in elegance and simplicity. So he does, in some way, he points out that as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality, they're not certain. And as far as they are certain, they do not refer to reality. Okay, this was in the context of quantum mechanics that he was not a fan of. All right. But to paraphrase it, uh, if the physical world is described by simple laws, why do we find it so difficult to predict things like the weather? And it turns out that we are actually surrounded by a whole lot of unpredictable events. Again, you know, when speaking at the time of COVID, one is 
but you know this is ironic but we, you know many of these things are just unpredictable and we'd like to understand why are they unpredictable turns out that all these happen to be instances of nonlinear phenomena and uh, these and but we are also surrounded by a lot of predictable events and uh, we've just had an eclipse a few uh, weeks ago eclipses sunrise sunset times and etc etc these can be predicted to a very high uh, degree of precision down to a few seconds uh, we knows well in advance when an event like an eclipse will occur now i'll just very briefly uh, tell you about the uh, 2009 eclipse which was uh, which happened in north india and uh, in the year 2000 itself i went to some website and got all this information uh, telling you where you could see it how long it would be when exactly it would be etc etc now uh, you know so it, it had a whole map and, and everything was available now i happened to go to varanasi that day and uh, when i reached varanasi uh, this is what i saw namely with all the planning we knew exactly where the uh, eclipse was going to be and so on and so forth however of course you couldn't tell that there would be a cloud covering the sun now this is this happened a few minutes before the total eclipse and uh, you know it it so happened that the clouds went away and we got a beautiful view of the of the total eclipse but still the unpredictability of the weather to be contrasted with the predictability of other you know phenomena like uh, the eclipse and so on now it turns out that this has its root in nonlinearity many of the uh, most of the physical laws are nonlinear but in a restricted regime they, they can be uh, approximated by linear laws and we use those for the most part because linear systems can be analyzed and we have an intuitive understanding but the real world has to be described by a nonlinear uh, by nonlinear equations or nonlinear uh, descriptions and you know just simple examples are there of hooke's law uh, or you know more that we take a pendulum pendulums are simple linear whenever you oscillate them slightly and when you do that you find that you can get the solution you uh, you know x which is this angle as a function of time you've got a very simple solution and if you should start with another solution x prime that also has a sort of a very uh, very it has the same uh, form and one of the things about linear systems is that if i make a small initial difference that is x of t and x of x prime of t x dash of t so small differences which are in in the initial conditions uh typified here by b minus b prime being small then x and x prime remain the difference between them also remains small for all times so linear systems are characterized by this that a small change in initial conditions doesn't lead to any major consequences and this is regard, you know remarkably not at all true in the nonlinear world uh, and the history of this field of what's called chaos goes to uh, the set of equations that was being studied by a meteorologist he was looking at the weather and looking at wind dynamics in the upper atmosphere and he was led to looking at the following set of nonlinear equations uh now these equations are very simple looking but what lorenz discovered is that when he uh used a computer to solve these equations because these are nonlinear he couldn't use a he couldn't write down a solution he discovered that calculations on two days did not agree owing simply to the fact that he had specified the starting point to four digit accuracy 
Today, you can do a simulation and show that if you start at the point which I've indicated over here, which is start, follow those equations which, are, which I've just specified, uh, sorry, these ones. You start at a particular initial point uh, with a blue pen and you trace out this object over here, which you can see looks like something which is swirling around on two sides, but following the blue line. If you start with an, another point ever so close by, but a red line, then for a little while, the red and the blue are indistinguishable, but pretty soon they separate from each other and become completely different. This is a, a feature which is called sensitivity to initial conditions. And it's very easy to see in a much, much simpler system, uh, which is the, this equation that I have written over here, x goes to 2x modulo 1. Namely, you take a number, you double it, and you throw away the part which is above 1. So if you take the number 1 third, double it, you get 2 thirds. If you double two thirds, you get four thirds, but four thirds is one plus one third, throw away the one, so you come back to one third. And so you can see that if I start with one thirds, I'll get two thirds, I'll, again I'll get one third, again I'll get two thirds, and so on and so forth forever. Now, instead of one third, if I take an approximation of 0.33, which is an error of just about three parts in a thousand. After one iteration, my error is six parts in a thousand. After another iteration, my error is my, the orbit is at 0 0.32 and not at one third. So the error is one part in a hundred. One more iteration, I, my error is two parts in a hundred and then five parts in 100, and one part in 10. And pretty soon, where I should have had one third, I'm getting some number like 0.12. So it's very sensitive to initial conditions. This makes prediction of nonlinear systems essentially impossible. And Lorenz was the first to actually recognize that these equations showed sensitivity to initial conditions. And this is what we call chaos today. And we see in various aspects of our lives how initial conditions make such a crucial difference and systems are basically so sensitive to that. And yet it turns out that if the same Lorenz equations if I start at the blue point, I'll go on to this thing, okay? This object, the solution follows the blue line. If I start at the red point, the solution follows the red line and both of them occupy the same space. These are called attractors. Namely, these are solutions that regardless of where you are, you are attracted to. And if the motion has sensitivity to initial conditions, namely if it is chaotic, then we call these strange attractors. This is a picture of the Lorenz uh, attractor. The motion on this is chaotic, namely if I start with two different initial conditions, they will follow different patterns, but they will be on the attractor. And it also looks like a butterfly and, uh, you know, Lorenz called chaos uh, the butterfly effect, which has gone on to spawn a whole lot of uh, memes in the popular literature. Now, coming back to the idea of, of chance, uh, I should point out that many attractors can coexist. And sensitive dependence on initial conditions means something like this that supposing I have, let's say four attractors, as you can see on the screen, if I start at a particular point, maybe I'll go to one of those attractors. If I start at another point, I could go to the same attractor or 
if I am, if I happen to be, uh, you know, the initial conditions may lead me to another attractor. So initial conditions that are all close to one another can in fact lead you to different attractors and very different initial conditions can lead you to the same attractor. So there is a lot of complexity that happens when many attractors coexist. This is actually not uncommon at all. Uh, shown uh, on your screen is this is a famous diagram. It's called the Necker cube. For many of you, this will be a cube coming out of the screen. And for many others of you, it will be a cube going into the screen. Both these coming in and going out are equally probable. Some people have a preference for the coming out. Some people have it for going in. And for many people, if you stare, it will go in and out. The existence of these two states, which are both equally probable, like the heads and the tails, is <clears throat> these are two attractors. Once you, once you start looking at it, you are attracted to one or the other side. And this is very fundamental to a lot of things like computation, to have systems which are bistable. If there are two attractors, and both of them can will attract uh, initial conditions. This is called this is an instance of bistability, right? And they are crucial to the implementation of logic gates and so on and so forth. Okay. Now it turns out that in the Lorentz system, when one of the parameters has a particular value, there are actually three attractors, and these three attractors attract different sets of initial conditions. You know, the blue uh, points all attract to, uh, to one of those attractors, to the butterfly attractor, actually. And there are two fixed points, point attractors, and the yellow, point, the yellow parts over here attract, uh, go to the fixed point one, or the green ones go to the other, and the blue ones go to the butterfly. Now, so you can see that different initial conditions can lead you to different attractors. Uh, and there's a very nice mathematical uh, problem, the, uh, you know, finding the roots of unity, uh, where if you start, you know, the cube root of unity, there are three of them. One is real, which is one, and there are two complex roots. And Newton gave a method for finding the roots of these equations, uh, of such an equation. Uh, so, <clears throat> Depending on where you start your initial condition, you will land up at one of the roots. Namely, you will either find the real root or you will find one of the two complex roots. In contrast to this system over here where all the blue points will go to one attractor, the yellow and the uh, yellow to another and the green to a third. In this particular situation, you find that the initial points that go to let us say the root one, have actually got a very beautiful geometry. And they are not, uh, you know, these, these curves are rather complicated. And the region between these two, uh, two roots uh, has a very interesting geometry, which unfortunately I don't have time to elaborate upon. But this gives the basic question that if you have many attractors, and they attract different initial conditions, what do their boundaries look like? Why this is important is that the boundaries can either be smooth or they can be complicated, fractal. And in fact, they can be actually incredibly complicated. And uh, here is a picture of one system with many attractors. And these many attractors have got many different basins. And these basins have got a very complicated structure uh, in which they are, the, the geometric structure is very complicated. All right. All right. Now, so getting a little closer to the idea of where chance comes in all this, because we do, you know, that there is enough uh, mathematical study of these phenomena. 
uh, where one realizes that basins can have a really complex geometry with one another. And if there is the possibility that arbitrarily close to a point that will go to one attractor, there is a point that goes to another attractor, all right? Then the basin of A, one attractor A, is said to be riddled with respect to another attractor B if for arbitrarily small differences, you can go from one to the other. If you can, if this is true, if A is riddled with respect to B and B is respect uh, is riddled with respect to A, then we call these basins intermingled. Namely, no matter where you start, you will either go to A or to B because even though these are completely deterministic systems. Uh, so initial conditions that lead to one or the other are as close together as rational and irrational numbers. So improving your numerical work or your precision in experiment or anything is of little use in predicting the final state. Right. So if you have, okay, so the simple thing here is that if you have many attractors, many possible final states, and their basins, the points that will go to these attractors are intermingled, then you cannot tell what is going to be the outcome because the smallest, smallest imprecision will lead you to something else. All right. All right. So this is, uh, I'm just going to skip over these three slides, but uh, let me just summarized by saying that even when the equations are known, even when the parameters are known, it's the nature of the attractors and their basins that can make the prediction of the outcome impossible. And this is what is chance. Okay, so now let's just get back to the coin and why is it, why is tossing a coin not a bad idea if you want to use chance? So you make the coin uh, imperfect and you let it bounce on the floor and these uh, gentlemen from Poland, uh, they've got a very nice long paper on this entire business of coin tossing. Uh, what they did was to do the mathematics even better. They determined the equations of motion for an imperfect coin because all coins we know are, they have you know, faces on them, heads and tails and so on. They also uh, took in the influence of air resistance and then they allowed it to bounce. Now, if they allowed it to bounce, they discovered that that is what actually gives you a lot of uncertainty in the outcome. Um, all right, so as I said, I'm going to uh, let you read this uh, later if you like, but the process of the coin bouncing on the floor has a significant influence on whether it comes as heads or tails, all right? And what they showed, okay, if you don't allow it to bounce, then it's almost like what Keller told us, zebra patterns with large amounts of, uh, large regions of black and white, all right? Uh, if you let it bounce many times, what they showed and it's a mathematical result, there is a set of initial conditions for which the coin tossing is predictable and there are regions where you have this intermingled basins of attraction. So any finite uncertainty in the initial conditions leads to the in uncertainty in the result of the to tossing. Now, if you allow it to bounce many times, etc., the basins become very complicated and then you can consider the tossing of a coin as an approximately random process. All right. So the physical basis of chance, and I've tried to illustrate this with uh, the idea of the coin toss, we say that there is a chance outcome when there are coexisting attractors, namely two or more different possibilities. But the important thing is that their basins of attraction have to be intermingled. 
if they are not intermingled, then you can always choose your conditions so carefully that you can get the desired outcome. Like we've seen in uh, the, uh, the case of the, uh, the coin toss experiment, or you know, it's fashionable to also quote the Puranas. Uh, so in the Mahabharat, we know that Shakuni was able to toss the dice uh, <laughs> precisely, but that is because he was able to choose his initial conditions extremely carefully. Uh, so let me now try to uh, wind up with a few uh, comments on, on why is all this so interesting. Now chance and contingency all right, have played a very fundamental role in the natural sciences at very many scales. Whether it is to do with the singularity of a certain event, such as the origin of life or the evolution of eukaryotes, the creation of evolutionary niches for the virus, for example, uh, or in a more mundane way, the manner in which noise at the microscopic le level can influence outcomes, chance has always had a very important role. Now, many systems are complex. In the, in the sense that they allow distant dynamical states to coexist. Um, I gave you, I showed you the example of the Necker cube. The two states are the going in and the going out, and these are distinct states and they coexist. In such systems, there is the possibility that small changes in initial states can lead to large changes in outcomes, and these give rise to complex patterns in space and time. Now, why is this important? Because by exploiting such a complexity, a system can explore new behavior in responding to the environment. And this has been a very important uh, role in, in uh, evolution. Now, chance plays in this way of thinking, it plays a very major role in biology. Uh, from Darwin onwards, the central lessons of biology have been that life itself is a game of chance and causation, the cause, is a matter of the context. Chance defines, is signifies possibility and therefore the freedom to create and which is why I think we all like chance so much. Uh, whether or not it derives from processes that follow a fundamental deterministic law Chance itself is a fundamental unavoidable reality because of, because of this background. This ought to be viewed as a good thing. If it was not so, we would not be here to ponder the seeming improbability of our own existence. And with this, let me again congratulate the university for its 10th anniversary and thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. That was a scintillating talk. Seriously, it was really good. And uh, we have a couple of questions. Can I start posing them straight away? Of course, of course. Um, this, the first two are from our YouTube live. The yeah. first one is from Prasun Avasti. He says, uh, are there any parameters whose fluctuation decreases with increase in temperature? For example, thermal fluctuations of ions and solution increase with increase in temperature. So are there a, is there a counter example to it? Um, I mean, the second law of thermodynamics basically says that there can't be, a, you know, much of a counter example. Uh, I mean, if I understand what uh, he's getting at, um, you know, if you decrease the temperature, of course, your fluctuations go down. But, you know, the microscopic origins of of chance over here says that regardless of how fine tuned your fluctuations are, there can be situations when even small, you know, vanishingly small fluctuations can lead you to different outcomes. So, I mean, you can never get away from that. Okay. Uh, the next one is from Paul Asir. He says, dear sir, does a non-quasi-periodic external force influence the formation of SNA? I mean, this is a very specific uh, question that has to do with the research of both mine and uh, whoever was asking. Uh, non-periodic, yeah, this, I, I, I mean, the technical answer is yes. 
uh, I think that non-periodic uh, external forces can create very nice kinds of attractors. Uh, but you know, it's simpler if you write me an email and we can talk about that separately because it doesn't have to do with this. Uh, the next question is from Zoom. Uh, this is from Nimba, who was our, I think, second batch of IMSC students of COTN, currently pursuing a PhD in quantum information somewhere in the Europe. He says, thank you, sir, for a great talk. You mentioned in the first few slides that a chance event may be due to incomplete or imprecise knowledge. How does it translate to the field of quantum mechanics? In specific, what separates a probabilistic event from being a chance or deterministic in case of absence of complete knowledge of the system? See, when you don't know, you know what I was trying to illustrate um, was that even if you knew everything about the system, if it so happened that the system had coexisting attractors and was nonlinear and it was chaotic, then you know, in the in the face of even complete precision, you would have uh, uncertainty in the outcome. Okay, so that was the, the basic point. Now, in quantum mechanics, the um, you know the origins of probability are more uh, you know they're more structural. So I don't want to actually con you know I don't want to speculate about the relationship of these two kinds of chances. Um, you know, especially because probability in quantum mechanics comes from uh, the type of Hilbert space that you have and so on and so forth. So um, let, let me not say more. I, mine was more to illustrate that even complete knowledge, nonlinearity is where you're going to get stuck with, with this. Uh... The next one is from uh, Nirbha Behra. Could you share your thoughts on applying such theory in strongly interacting medium like quark gluon plasma? I have seen some work by people on, uh, you know, the importance of chaos in uh, in in sort of in things like QTP and so on. Uh, so, okay, see, many of these situations do have coexisting attractors and so on and so forth. Uh, so I wouldn't be surprised if chaos has something to say in many of these kinds of situations. This is Professor Sujata Tarifdar from uh, Jadavpur University. She was our uh, panelist for the work on uh, drop drying in pattern. Yeah. She asks if, uh, can Professor Ramswamy comment on the much improved prediction of weather recently, which, has con which was considered a paradigm of unpredictability? Thanks yeah. for the excellent lecture. All right. Yeah. Uh, so, Sujata, the thing is that, uh, you know, a purely uh, equation based uh, prediction of weather cannot really go very, very, uh, very, very far. All right. Uh, because, uh, you know, because, you know, even if it's more, just excuse me for a moment while I go back to my being on flight mode. Um, right. Uh, See, if, even if you take the Lorentz equations and make it better and more accurate and so on and so forth, you're never going to do uh, well. What is being done today and that is, is to do actually a combination of um, some amount of modeling, a lot of real-time data. So you use huge data, big data, AI, these kinds of tools and techniques. If you have a lot of observations, and then you're able to pin your observations to uh, some part of simulations, then these kinds of combination methods, where this, which are somewhat semi-empirical, they actually tend to work a lot better. Uh, leaders in this are in the Maryland group, for example, they, they use chaos, and meaning they use uh, the methods of chaos theory, but they also use a lot of real-time data for pinning their solutions. Kalavati has a question. Uh, she's like, are there examples of deterministic linear systems showing riddled attractors? Is there a theorem that establishes it one way or the other? For linear systems, there is just no hope, right? Linear systems will not even have, uh, uh, they, they will not be able to, be, linear will not do it, right? Uh, so, uh, 
I, I'm, I'm sure that one, you know, there will be simple nonlinear systems which can show this kind of riddled uh, basins and so on. Um, it, it shouldn't be too difficult to find some literature. If you write to me, I'll, I, I can pursue this conversation a little more. Okay, we, we have, uh, I think, two more questions and uh, one person who wants to speak to you. Arul Das Martin, who's our colleague uh, from here, asks, what kind of role recent techniques in information technology, specifically machine learning, can play in this area of prediction? Uh, there are some very you know, spectacular advances in the last few years on using uh, machine learning. Uh, this is a, it's a tool called reservoir computing, which has made a lot of ripples. Uh, people have been able to predict much, much longer than the time of uncertainty. Uh, you know, in, in the business of chaos, there is a rate at which, you know, information is lost in the system and uh, new machine learning tools can actually go to predictions which are twice that, uh, that, uh, lens, uh, that time scale. So I believe that there's a lot of future for these kinds of, uh, these kinds of methods, yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Pramila, who's from our uh, education department and uh, with a specialization in mathematics. She says, thanks, sir. Uh, unbiased coin, it shows, it follows binomial distribution, but when the number of tossing increases, that is as n tends to infinity, the distribution is normal. The predictability increases. Mm -hmm. Not only binomial distribution, even Poisson distribution tends to normal distribution. So any comment on that? See, what I was trying to, to, to talk about was what is the tossing of a single coin? If I take a single coin and I toss it, then the actual event of a single coin is not random, right? Now, if I take many coins, I let them, you know, I, I explore different parts of the, uh, of the sort of initial space of velocity and angular momentum and so on and so forth. Then as I showed towards the end of my talk, then you do in fact come up with um, this sort of unpredictability. And then when once you have the unpredictability, then it goes over into uh, the, uh, you know, the law of, uh, uh, the, then the central limit theorem will apply and therefore you will get your, uh, your Poisson and your uh, normal distribution anyhow. Uh one of our alumni, again, I think from the second batch, uh, Tejas, uh, who's currently a PhD student at IIT Hyderabad in chemistry, wants to speak to you. Uh, but would that be simpler done, Madhu, if you share my phone number with... Uh... I mean, no, he just has a comment to make, I guess. Speak oh, sure, sure, sure. Please, you know, bring so him on. Like the question. Uh, Tejas? Hey, uh, Dr. Ram, uh, that was... Uh, thank you for the wonderful talk. It was thank really you. nice uh, listening to you speak. Um, I was just thinking about uh, the topics that you mentioned, chance and chaos with respect to uh, molecular dynamic simulations. Yeah. So, so you know, um, the last example you brought out, I mean, different initial conditions and it leads to almost the same or a, a similar sort of an outcome. So mm -hmm. I was just thinking about it that way. So you start the same sort of a system with different coordinate points, mm -hmm. but when we average out uh, certain properties, uh, certain, um, uh, but we, we still get, get the same values. So I was just yeah. thinking about it. No, it certainly is an instance of that. You see, because when you do a molecular dynamics uh, simulation or Monte Carlo or what have you, you are trying to find the minimum energy solution, right? Yes. And that, that solution is an attractor. Oh. Right. Right? So if you have many such uh, solutions, I mean, they could all be different kinds of attractors. In fact, what is minimization? Minimization is just to try to find the attractor with the lowest energy. Yeah, okay, okay. Yeah. So that, that put things to perspective. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ram. Actually, the last question before I ask the Vice Chancellor to speak. Uh, this is Shakti Nath Singh who says, uh, stochastic simulations we use uh, to mimic the systems like biological systems, is it, accurate? is it an accurate way to predict the system's fate? Uh, see, the thing is that you use, uh, there, you, see, cha already you see, you take a lot of probabilistic um, uh, ideas, and that is an intrinsic component in stochastic simulations. 
namely i'm not in a stochastic simulation i'm not looking at the microscopic origin of where chance comes about i just assume that the whole system is so complicated I, that i cannot predict anything about it other than to just look at some geometric factors and that is the end of it okay so uh, the you know in in stochastic simulations um, it's already assumed that the event is probabilistic all right so this is a slightly different context that's all so the rest of them are all comments thanking you for a really superb talk and for having introduced us my pleasure madhu and uh, you know I, i think the vc has gone somewhere uh, yeah i don't think he's around yeah. uh, can i so you yeah, on behalf of cotn let me thank you once again for all the efforts that you have put in to deliver this one talk and i know how many efforts have gone into that thank you very much for a truly wonderful oh, talk. my my pleasure and uh, you know please give my congratulations again not just to the vice chancellor but also to uh, all the uh, all the faculty all the staff uh ah there he is but i have a couple of questions just before he comes in can i ask you just quick two is, questions uh, i think professor das is back here madhu oh then fine yeah go ahead okay. sir uh, would you like to uh so you have to unmute yourself yeah yeah see yeah. i am uh, sir thank you very much for a fantastic talk in fact as a biologist is fascinated me <laughs> i don't know anything about physics and mathematics but i was really i really thoroughly enjoyed your talk and you hope all everybody would have enjoyed it and we will be very happy if you can visit the university sometime and have one interaction with the students and the faculty here in future thank you very much most grateful and most obliged sir thank you well thank you again professor das and i'd like to also you know i was just telling madhu that i would like to extend my congratulations not just to you but to your entire team to the entire faculty and my very very best wishes to all of you for the next 100 years thank you very much sir thank you